All right, hello all. Welcome to lecture two for 30th June. So let me share my screen with you all. All right, so this is where I had stopped in the last class. All right, so, I've, so we talked about what does fusion, vaporization, sublimation means, as well as this term, deposition, condensation, and freezing. All right, but again, like I told you, for problem's sake, I'm just going to focus on these terms right fusion vaporization and sublimation and which you're going to see in a couple of slides and how we're going to use it All right but make sure you understand these terms what does, does the age of fusion the that's of vibration and the that's of sublimation means and then i told you all you have to do for this problem is understand the difference between between those terms and then figure out from the table here which substance has the highest and the lowest enthalpy of fusion right so think about the enthalpy of fusion is as the amount of heat or energy required to change a solid to a liquid all right so now moving on so kind of kind of very related to this concept that i've been talking about right fusion and then Vaporization is going to come into play whenever I talk about heating curve. All right. So basically, the concept of heating curve is basically what you are doing is you are plotting the. Where is my phone doing now? Okay, I cannot. Okay. If you could hide this somewhere. All right, so all you are doing is you are plotting the heat added, right? So do you see how you are adding heat, adding heat, adding heat, right? And whenever you add heat, not surprisingly, right, the temperature increases. I think about that as y-axis. That's why the temperature is in the y-axis, all right? versus for how much time did you hit up that particular substance all right so what i wanted to focus here on is look at points a b c d e f so i wanted to just think about let's say when you are trying to vaporize ice right so let's say you're given a block of ice and i tell you oh go ahead and vaporize this ice Right, vaporize this ice means you have to convert that solid ice into vapor ice, if you want to call it. Right, or in other terms, solid form of water into vapor form of water. Right, this is the point where you were given the ice point A. Then, what you're going to do is over time, you're going to, as the temp you are going to input the heat, the ice is going to start melting. Right, but that is still ice though, right. The ice as was at let's say negative four degrees Celsius. Let's just say that number. And now the ice has reached at zero degrees Celsius. But remember, at kind of like zero degrees Celsius, the ice is still ice, right? Because it's like in equilibrium with ice and water. It has not completely converted to water. Now, after you go to point B, what is going to happen is you're going to have to input some more heat. So that all the ice will change to water at point C. But then remember that water is still at zero degrees Celsius. Do you see how this wax is as this at zero degrees Celsius? All right. Then what I'm going to do is that water, I'm going to heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius, right? Over time, this water is going to heat up to 100 degrees Celsius. Now, at 100 degrees Celsius, that water is still water. 
now I have to input some heat to vaporize that water off at 100 degrees Celsius. So think about this D point as is still liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius, whereas E point as liquid water has converted to vapor water at E point, right? That's why it says vaporizing water. And finally, let's say if I'm trying to heat that vapor to 200 degrees Celsius, if I keep continuously adding heat, that vapor at 100 degrees Celsius will have a temperature of 200 degrees Celsius if I heat it up for a certain amount of time. So I hope you're able to read the heating curve as to what it means and what the what are the points whenever I say heating ice, melting ice, heating liquid water, vaporizing water, heating steam, and those terms. All right. So now the first thing that I want you to this is something that you learned in K115, all right? What does specific heat means? So the amount of joules or energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. That's called the specific heat, right? So this might ring a bell. So you learn something about Q equals MC delta T. So this CS is the same as this CS that we learn in KM115, right? Amount of heat that you require to raise the temperature of one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. That's why. The CS has this unit, right? Joules per gram degree Celsius. Amount of heat to raise temperature of one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. All right, so now this process of going from A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, and E to F can be summarized in this way. Okay. So A to B, what I did was I heated the ice from minus 22, ice at zero degrees Celsius. So again, I want to convert that to water. Now, what we've learned in K115 is this formula called Q equals to MC delta T, right? To convert a substance or to raise the temperature of substance to a certain temperature change, you can use that formula Q equals to MC delta T. That's what I did here. All right, where Q is the amount of heat added right m is the mass of that ice or how much ice you have and cs is the specific heat capacity of ice not water because remember i was i'm just heating ice to ice so think about ice ice baby tem, 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 tem. all right and finally delta t is the change in temperature right and again remember in chemistry or anywhere, whenever someone says delta T, it's always final minus initial T, final minus T initial. All right. So now to go from B to C. Now, this is where the thing gets a little bit interesting and is different from Kim 115. All right. Now, to go from B to C, remember, now it's the ice at zero degrees Celsius changing to water at zero degrees Celsius. That means I cannot use the CS formula. The reason being the specific heat capacity is uh, specific to a substance, right? Like specific heat capacity of ice is different from specific heat capacity of water. That's why now what I'm gonna use is this formula, the amount of heat that I need to convert, melt this ice at zero degrees Celsius to water degrees Celsius. N times the delta H of fusion, where N is the number of moles. Because remember, whenever I melt that ice at zero degrees Celsius to water at zero degrees Celsius, number of moles does not change. That's why this is my formula, N times delta H of fusion. And remember how we had defined delta H of fusion as the amount of energy required, right, to change a solid phase of a substance to its liquid phase. All right, so I hope this is making sense. And we can follow the same format, right? For let's say even hitting the water from C to D point, here is what we have to do. And then evaporating the water at 100 degrees Celsius to steam at 100 degrees Celsius, we can again use the delta H of vaporization, the delta H of fusion, because water going to steam is the process of vaporization. All right, so I hope this is kind of making sense because this is what I'm gonna use to kind of solve 
this problem. All right, it looks really small and simple, but trust me, it has a, like lots of steps that we're gonna follow, all right? But the good thing that I've done to make your life easy is basically, I'm just literally going to use this, everything. All right, to get my answer. The question is gonna ask me how much heat is required to convert 135 gram of ice, right? So you have 135 gram of ice. So let's just say this is ice, right? Then I have to convert that all the way to paper. So let's just, let me just draw this paper by something like this. And then let's just draw the liquid water like this, right? But then again, remember, I have to go through all these steps, right? I have to hit the ice, melt the ice, hit the liquid water, vaporize the water, and then finally even hit the steam. All right. And all the numbers have been given to you. Again, there's the typo. It should be small k, all right? Remember that. A small k. This is small k as well, not capital J. A capital k. Small k. Kilojoules per mole. All right, so now let's work it out again. All I'm going to do is let's try to think about this, right? So the coal is required. Equals to remember, it did say from ice all the way to water vapor at 120 degrees Celsius. Because I know that once I reach 100 degrees Celsius, I have to again hit that steam. That means I have to go through all this process, A, B, B, C, C to D, D to E, E to F, right? So that's what I'm going to write down, that down now. A, B, amount of heat required to go from A to B to B to C, it's supposed to be plus sign, but for some reason, my screen doesn't read my, yeah, it doesn't read it here. Plus B, C, plus C, D, plus D, E, and then plus E, F. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a circle or, around the ones where I have to use the delta H of fusion or delta H of vaporization. All right, so. Uh, All right, so which one was the one used? Uh, e through F, okay. And then E through F. And then there should be, I think I, they're missing one thing where I have to. No, I don't want to cancel it. No, I hope they didn't take me. All right, and then there, that's why it's confusing. Right, so they, it does have like we have to hit the steam up to 120 degrees Celsius. Now, this, so I'm just going to call that process F2Z. So by that I mean that once you get to F, no, sorry, E to F is hitting steam. Sorry, what am I missing? So D to E is vaporizing. What the? Uh, where is the E to F? Mm. D to E. Sorry, D2E is the one. Ah. So, my bad, there's no FT. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, I'm just gonna. Okay. Put it down again. My bead. My bead. You, I make lots of mistakes. So B to D is no, it's B to C that is the one that's what it was. All right. So that's what you get at is B to C is the one, and then. E to E is the one 
for up to use for B2C up to use delta H of fusion and for D2E I have to use the delta H of vaporization. Right, so all I'm gonna do now is use this formula. For A to B, I'm gonna use Q equals to MC delta T. For B to C, I'm gonna use N times delta S fusion and so on. All right, so let's write that down. So for A to B, it's M of ice, right? So I'm just gonna call it ice, C delta T, right? Plus for B to C, my formula says N, which is the number of moles of ice times delta S fusion. That fusion of ice. And I'm going to circle this in green so it's easy for you to see. This is the part where I do not use the formula MC delta T. All right. For C2D, right, I go back. My C2D tells me that, oh, it's MC delta T, right? But now, and we're talking about water here, right? That's why this is C is for the water. Let me just write down CI is for species capacity of ice. CW is the species capacity of water. That will make your life easy. Right, so I'm done with A, B, B, C, and C, D. Now let's look at D, right? I go back. My D says I need N times delta H of vaporization for that. Finally, e for E to F, M of steam. Let me just call that steam, all right? Because once water, liquid water becomes steam, it's vapor form, right? So M, S, that's why the M, S. And then C, S stands for the speed heat capacity of steam, and then delta T. And I'm going to circle this in green so you can see clearly those two parts, so A, B, C, and D, where I did not use the formula MC delta T, whereas I use the formula N times delta S fusion. All I have to do now is just plug in the values, everything I know. All right, mass of ice is 135 gram. I'm going to not write the, the units, but make, make sure that you are following the units carefully. All right. Because this mass is in gram. That's good because my specific capacity C is in gram as well. And my delta T has to be in degree Celsius, right? Because my specific capacity is in degree Celsius. All right. So to save some space, I'm just going to start writing those numbers. 135 times 2.09 has been given me. That's the specific capacity of ice, which is different from water. Keep this in mind. This is the specific capacity of ice that I used for this part. Times the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to change that minus 15 degrees Celsius and I have to take that to zero degrees Celsius, right? So my math is going to look like zero minus minus 15. Because remember, the formula for delta T is final minus initial, so my final is zero degrees Celsius. All right, on plus, my number of moles. All right, so I have been given 135 gram of ice. All right, now remember, ice is literally water. All right, so that means for, to convert that 180, sorry, 135, grams of ice, I can use the molar mass of water to convert that number of moles. And I know that water's molar mass is 18.01 gram of water is in one mole of water. Or ice doesn't matter because number of moles is the same, right? When I do the math, I'm going to get 7.494 moles. I hope this is making sense, right? This is the mole of ice. And that's why for my this n, I'm going to put that number 7.494. Let's call it 7.5. And it's going to, and the delta H fusion has been given to me as where, 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 right here, 6.01 kilojoules per mole. But what I'm going to do is, since I had that, uh, all the other units in joules, right? Do you see how my specific capacity was in joules? That's why I'm going to have that change that 6.01 kilojoules per mole to directly to joules per mole. That's why. You see that number six zero one zero joules per mole written directly. Right, so I'm done with the first one. Right, I'm done with the second one. Let's move to the third one now. Now, third one is the part where now I'm gonna take that water at zero degrees Celsius. Right, I'm gonna convert that water, or I'm gonna see how much heat is required to change that. 
mass of water to 100 degrees Celsius, from zero to 100 degrees Celsius. The mass of water. Remember, whenever that 135 gram of ice changed to water, right, it's the same mass because mass is never destroyed in this process, right? That means my mass M is still gonna be 135 gram for the mass of water. Now, the C specific capacity of water is different. Look at that, it's 4.18 times 4.18. Now, I have to take that 0 degrees Celsius water to 100 degrees Celsius, right? That's why 100 minus zero. And again, it's 100 minus zero. My screen doesn't like to write at that place. I don't know why. This is literally 100 minus zero, this part right here, where I'm underlining in blue, it's 100 minus zero. All right, so I'm done that part. Moving on, next one is N delta vaporization. Does the number of moles change? No, that means my number of moles is the same, 7.5 times my delta of vaporization is 40.67 kilojoules per mole. I'm gonna convert that to joules per mole. Right, so I'm going to be left with 40670 joules per mole. All right, that means I'm done with this part as well. Now, the last part M S delta T for the steam. All right, so I'm just going to write on plus here. The mass of steam is the same 135 gram. Right, now the species capacity of steam CS is given as 1.84 times now look at this the question is asking me how much is required to convert this much into water vapor at 120 degrees celsius right that means now i've changed that steam at 100 degrees celsius 220 degrees celsius that's why final minus initial again it just takes some time and that's why i have been telling um you that uh the exams i am not asking you to just pick the right answer if you just so this much process even though you get the wrong answer you are going to get full half the credit all right so if i do the math i'm gonna do so individual states if i do the math i'm gonna end up with four one five four five zero point seven joules and then that is equals to 415 kilo joules if i divide this by thousand That means 415 kilojoules of energy is required to convert 135 gram of ga gas at minus 15 degrees Celsius to vapor at 120 degrees Celsius. So I hope at least like uh, take some time, look at it, right? And again, all you have to do is remember, I'm not asking you to memorize all this, right? This is something that you can just write on your note and in the exam you can use it, but make sure you know how to use it, right? Otherwise, you won't be able to do these problems because I'm not going to give you the same numbers. Definitely, I'm going to change the numbers here and there. All right. All right. So I hope the hitting curve and this question makes sense and you're able to answer the questions on Alex now. All right, the next concept. And then for the phase diagram, I'm not going to go into much depth into this concept of triple point and all those things. All right. All I'm going to spend some time is trying to tell you how to read a phase diagram. That's all I'm going to spend my time on. All right, the first thing, and this is something I think if you took 115 with me, at least in the fall, I think I spent some time, maybe five or 10 minutes in the lecture to talk about it, all right? For the first, for the phase diagram, what you have to understand is, understand the graph, what is it about, all right? It is pressure versus temperature, all right? That means as you go up the y-axis, the pressure increases. And then as you go to the right across the x-axis, the temperature increases. And then we're trying to see how does substance, right? Or how does the phase of a substance is as we play around with pressure and temperature? All right, so that's why you are going to see something like solid, liquid and gas right because i'm playing around with oh let's say this might be solid water which is ice right but then after i reach a certain pressure and certain temperature oh that solid starts converting to converting to liquid 
right? And then once I pass this line, all this liquid will start changing into gas. And once I start to reach this temperature and pressure, it's called PC, all this liquid and gas, they'll start acting as supercritical fluid. And again, I do not care if you want to know about supercritical fluid or not, look it up, but again, I'm not gonna ask you in the exams. All I'm gonna ask you from the phase diagram is how to read the phase diagram. So what I mean by that, all right, is, So this is the this is the part I'm not worried about, all right? For the general feature of the field. if you want to read it and explore more, be my guest, but it won't be on the exam, right? So let's learn to apply how it how it works, all right? So on the left I have H2O molecule, water. On the right, also, but then on the right, what I have done is I've kind of uh, Blown this certain part, right? So this part right here, zero to negative zero point five. So let's think about this to two hundred. So this part right here has been magnified. Do you see how this is zero degrees Celsius here, right? And then how this is this one hundred and fifty, two hundred, so up to two hundred. So this part right here has been magnified into this. Both of them are the phase diagram for water, all right? All right, so now let's focus on the one on the left. All right, so what this tells you here, all right, is first thing, let's look at some of the points, right? Because we know that water at, uh, yeah, this is, is at zero degrees Celsius, right? And then at this pressure, water is always in its ice form. It's solid. Now let's see if I start increasing the temperature of that liquid ice, right? As I go from zero to higher temperature, this demarcation, Right here, the solid ice is going to start converting to liquid water. All right, and then as I increase the temperature to let's say 100 degrees Celsius and further, you're gonna get some water vapor. All right, but let's look at this, right? So let's say if I'm at 100 degrees Celsius and let's say 200 atm, what's this? I'm at 100 degrees Celsius and 200 atm. And look at that. The water has not vaporized to water vapor yet because the pressure is so high. All right. That makes sense, right? Because remember, we talked about how the boiling point of water increases as the atmospheric pressure increases, right? We talked about Mount Everest, right? Highest point on Earth, the water boiled around 70 degrees Celsius, right? But if you go to somewhere in sea level, which has higher atmospheric pressure, right? I'm just gonna write down the term lower ATM pressure. All right. Now there it's boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. So that tells you that as the pressure external pressure or atmospheric pressure increases, the boiling point increases as well. And that's what's happening here, right? So look at that. At 100 degrees Celsius, if it was only, let's say, 1 atm, the liquid water is converted, because remember, this is all, this part right here, this is all vapor water, right? But then if I start increasing the pressure, the liquid water will stay still as liquid, all right? So now let's look at the other example. What's this? So let's see if I'm at 300 degrees Celsius. Now remember the boiling point, the normal boiling point of water in at sea level at 1 atm 
is 100 degrees Celsius. That means in, at 300 degrees Celsius, all the liquid water should, in theory, vaporize to water vapor, right? But what's this at 300 degrees Celsius? Well, let's see if I'm at 200 atmospheric pressure. This is 200 atmospheric pressure and 300 degrees Celsius. That liquid water has not vaporized, it's still in the liquid water form because this demarcation right here, that's where everything is, there is liquid water. So I hope this makes sense as to how to move around in the, uh, so let's kind of work through this example, right? So I have a question here, and hopefully this will tell you how to read All right, so it's asking me predict the physical form of sample of water, right? Let's just say H2O molecule. Definitely every time I see, use the word, word water, I think about the liquid form. I do not think about ice or water vapor, all right? So it's asking me at 400 degrees Celsius. So I'm gonna go and find my 400 degrees Celsius on the X axis, which is right here. And then yes, you might hear my cat meowing in the background. We'll, we'll put that one to show you and 150 ATM. So I'm gonna find my 150 ATM. So it's this purple line right here. You see that 150 ATM, right? So if I, so I'm talking about 400 degrees Celsius, so I'm talking about point A. So it's asking me what is the physical form of the sample of water at that point, right? So if I look at this, it tells me that there's a line right here. That means this all right here is my water vapor. That means water, at 400 degrees Celsius and 150 AGM is in its paper form. So let's move on, right? So it says, what things occur as the sample is slowly allowed to cool to negative 50 degrees Celsius at a constant pressure of 150 AGM? So it's asking you, as you move from point A to point E, how is that water vapor is going to change? So they're saying like, okay, the pressure is constant at 150 ATM, but then we're gonna slowly cool it down. We're gonna move to the left of the x-axis. That means the temperature is going down, right? Now, what's this? As we go from A to B, right? And this is called the vapor curve, all right? So now, that's where the transition from liquid to vapor happens. Now, at that point, at point B, the liquid water is, in, is at equilibrium with water vapor, all right? Now, I'm gonna keep going down, all right? I'm gonna, so this was at around, let's say, I'm just gonna put the number here, 350, 350 degrees Celsius, this point right here, all right? I'm gonna go down to point C. You look at C, C is about 120, this point right here, 120 degrees Celsius, right? And then 150 ATM. At that pressure and temperature, look at this, we're in the area of liquid water. Now, if you go from C to D, this D is again the point where the ice and liquid water are in equilibrium, right? And finally, when you go to point E, which is at, let's say, about negative 50 degrees Celsius. And again, the pressure is constant at 150 ATM. All right. At that temperature and pressure, that is all the dice. So I hope this makes sense. All right, how I worked on this problem. All right, so for your knowledge take, you're gonna refer to the phase diagram of water in the earlier slide. And it's asking you predict the physical form of sample of water at 100 atm pressure as the temperature increased from minus 1.5 to negative 0 0.5. For this example, make sure you use this graph, not this graph, because it's really hard to see when you go from 0 to negative 0 0.5 degrees here, right? That's why this has been magnified for you, so you can easily see when you move from 0 to 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5 degrees Celsius, what happens. All right, so make sure you use this graph and answer this question. The question is just asking you what is the physical form of a sample of water at a particular pressure and temperature. All right, 
now this marks the end of chapter 10 and again i have not talked about and something like critical point uh, uh triple point and those things will not show up in exam one all right so don't worry about the general features of his diagram all i want you to do is be able to read what happens to the phase of a substance as we move around the temperature and pressure as we play around with the temperature and pressure all right so chapter 12 so chapter 11 these are the concepts that i'm gonna cover in chapter 11 lots of concepts all right, but it isn't that bad trust me so basically we're kind of focusing on solutions right so we talked about delta h of vaporization delta h of fusion right so they kind of give an idea about what happens or how much energy is absorbed or released whenever a liquid sample is changed into let's say vapor sample right or delta h fusion talks about the energy change or amount of energy absorbed whenever a solid converts to liquid all right in this chapter we'll kind of talk about that as well right so whenever you think about solution right so let's say if i take a beaker of water right and if i dissolve some sugar in it or let's just say salt nacl salt right table salt right we can even measure the how much energy is absorbed or released whenever we create that solution and that's why we're going to talk about as well right the rule of enthalpy a solution formation and something like that and beside that we're going to talk about all those properties of solution as to what happens to boiling point whenever you add more solute to water does it go up does it go down what happens to freezing point right and then why do I think the county does it, or I, I don't know, the state does it, right? Whenever it snows during winter, why do they sprinkle some salt, right? So hopefully by the end of this chapter, you'll be able to answer this question, right? So we're going to talk about that freezing point, depression, and those kind of concepts in this chapter. At first, let's just think about what is a solution, all right? So basically, whenever you dissolve a solute in a solvent, what you form is a solution, right? So one thing to keep in mind, whenever you form a solution, whenever we're talking about this solution, what we're expecting is we are not creating any chemical change, right? Basically, what's this? We well, have zinc nitrate, which I dissolve in pure water. So anytime you see this L written beside water, it's just telling you that it's liquid water because L stands for liquid, all right? So what's gonna happen is this cation and anionic part of the salt are going to disintegrate into water, right? And that's why they dissolve in water, right? If they didn't disintegrate or break apart, they wouldn't have been able to dissolve in water. Now this is an example of solution because the zinc and nitrate, they are still there. I did not change their chemical composition all right because literally i can just evaporate the water off or i can vaporize the water off and get my zinc nitrate back all right so now some some of these terms solubility is basically how much of the solid substance you can dissolve in a given amount of solvent that's called solubility right and then something to keep in mind it is temperature and pressure specific I mean, if you increase the temperature, maybe the solubility increases or decreases. If you increase the pressure, that can happen as well. That's why I've said I've specified temperature and pressure. All right, now the other term is something called saturated solution. All right, so let's see if I have a beaker of water right here. And I have this water. I'm going to start dissolving this zinc nitrate in there, right? This is my zinc nitrate salt. But then if I stir it, what's gonna happen is this is gonna be a homogeneous solution, right? It's gonna be clear. So let's assume that zinc nitrate is a white salt. It's gonna be clear, and then you won't see the salt any longer, right? So it has dissolved or it has become soluble in water. All right. 
So let's say if I start adding zinc nitrate, right? One teaspoon, two teaspoons, there's going to be a point where you can add a maximum possible amount of zinc nitrate. And that point is called the saturated solution. Does that make sense? That means you have made or you have prepared a saturated solution, the maximum possible amount of solid that you can add to the solvent where it dissolves. That's called saturated solution. Now, after you reach that saturated solution at a specified temperature and pressure, if I add more of the zinc nitrate, what happens? You're gonna create something called an unstable solution where the zinc nitrate will not dissolve in the water no more. Right, and you might see something like this, right? You have water, right? Yeah, there's something that dissolved, but then when it doesn't dissolve anymore, you might see this lump of zinc nitrate that didn't dissolve at the bottom of the beaker, right? Now, that means what you have created is something called super saturated solution. So, I hope this makes sense. So, what is a solution? What is solubility, right? Saturated solution and super saturated solution. All right, so whenever you form the solution in our, in our early example, right, in a beaker of water with zinc nitrate, right, so basically whenever I say aqueous, I'm just, I, I, we write that in chemistry to tell you that, oh, this ion has dissolved in water. All right now now the reason that zinc 2 plus the zinc nitrate disintegrated in water is basically what is happening is here is basically you have water molecule i'm just going to write down water molecule that is going to surround zinc 2 plus same thing with water 2 nitrate right you're going to have h2o water for h2o h2 around it that's why they disintegrated in water, right? Now, instead of water, if let's say if I have some other solvent, all right? So whenever you surround each solid particle with particles of solvent like I did here, that process is called solvation. You see how I surrounded this gender Z and 2 plus, this solid particle with water, 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 that's called solvation all right now solvation refers to the process where you use any type of solvent all right but if that solvent is in water then that process is called hydration so basically what i drew here is this process called hydration here i surrounded the solid particle with molecules of water that's why this process is hydration now instead of that let's say if i surrounded this zinc 2 plus with other solvent they just call that solvent dmso right there is a solvent called dmso which is pretty polar that can dissolve zinc nitrate to some extent now if i surround that with some other solvent now instead of calling hydration i'm going to start calling that solvation so this process is solvation Right here is solvation. All right, so I hope this makes sense. So hydrate, think about this whenever we talk about hydrate, right, we think about water, right? We've got to hydrate our cells, CLLS, in our body. That's hydration because we need water. Other solvents doesn't work for our body. All right, that's why hydration means solid particles surrounded by water molecule, where solvation means solid particles surrounded by uh, some other forms of solvent. All right, so make sure you Think about these concepts. What is the saturated solution? Difference, and difference between solvation and hydration, probably important from exam one point of view. All right, so now let us try to understand that process, right? Where I said dissolving of zinc nitrate into water. All right? So that dissolving of zinc nitrate into water, I'm going to use this picture to show you. All right? So this is my zinc nitrate right here, and because it's, it's right now it's in salt form, right? Before I dissolve in water, 
right? This is my water right here. Water molecule is the solvent. And then after I put the ginger in water and if I stir it, it's in a solution form. This is in the solution form. All right, so we'll get to that first. Now let's kind of define some of these terms. What does the delta H solution mean? All right, so again, remember delta H basically all it is saying you is basically how much heat, if, you know, if it helps you, all right, how much heat is absorbed or released during the process of forming a solution. That's it, right? Think about it, right? So whenever we define delta H of vaporization, the way we had defined this was amount of energy, right? Absorbed or released, or the amount of heat absorbed or released for the liquid to go to vapor, right? We define that as delta H vaporization. Same thing here, right? The delta H solution, we're gonna define that as amount of heat absorbed or released, right? Because that amount of heat absorbed or released can be termed as enthalpy change. Whenever you form a solution, that's called the delta H of solution. Right now, to find the delta H of solution, all I can do is I can add these three enthalpy change values up. What are these enthalpy change values? All right, so first H1, it says change in enthalpy of first separation of solvent particles. And look at this. So I have a solvent water molecule. I'm going to separate them apart. Right? And whenever I do that, there's some enthalpy change associated with that delta H of 1. All right, now my second one, it says delta H2 is the change in enthalpy for separation of solute particles. So I have that zinc nitrate, right? Remember, zinc nitrate is a salt, right? To make sure that dissolves in water, I have to disintegrate that salt, right? Or they pull the zinc and nitrate apart. Look at that delta H2. Delta H2 is talking about this process when the solute has broken apart into the zinc and nitrate form. And the enthalpy change associated for that process is called delta S2. And finally, right, so I separated the solute out, I separated the solvent out, right? So these are the separated particles. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is something called delta S3, right? Now the solute and solvents are going to interact. And there is also some kind of enthalpy change. There's also either heat added or removed, right? The amount of heat absorbed or released whenever solute interacts with solvent. And that delta H, we're gonna define that as delta H3. And this is my delta H3, where this solute, and solvent has interaction, and look at this, they have formed a solution. All right, now what I'm telling you is, this delta S solution is basically the sum of delta H1, delta H2, and delta H3. All right, delta H1 referring to separation of solvent particles, delta H2 separation of solid particles, delta H3, whenever the solid and solvent interaction. Now all these delta H1, H2, S3, look at this delta H1, H2, S3, right? Now, what's this? So, if you look at this process, right, the delta S3 here is negative first, right, and it's very big number negative, right? Delta H1 is positive because it does take energy, right, to break the solvent molecules apart. That's why this delta H1 is positive, this delta S2 again. If you want to break this zinc, zinc nitrate apart into zinc and nitrate, it does take some energy. That's why this delta S2 is positive. But then these two positive numbers are smaller than this big negative numbers. That's why for this first process, the delta H of solution is going to be a negative number. That's why you see delta S solution is less than zero. All right, so I hope this makes sense, all right? I'm not gonna show you or tell you anything about figure two, 
or figure B because your knowledge stick is based on that. Right? But again, I hope this makes sense. So what does this knowledge stick asks you is what is the change in enthalpy for solute and solvent interaction? So I'm talking about solute and solvent interaction. I'm talking about this part. Sorry, this part right here. And all I'm asking is is the sign of in enthalpy. I'm asking you whether it's positive or negative. That's all I'm asking you. And I'm asking you the change in enthalpy of the solution. All right, so for the second one, I'm asking you delta H of solution. When I say change in enthalpy of the solution. Because remember, this right here, that's the delta H for solute and solvent interaction. Not for the solute and for the solution, not the delta H for solution. All right, so I hope this makes sense. All right, so now, uh, now this is something that I, I'm gonna just slightly touch on it, but then we'll spend the whole probably week talking about entropy and enthalpy and then free energy towards the end of the semester, but quickly, all right, as to why do you think solution is formed, right? Or what favors solution is something called entropy. Now, anytime you hear this word entropy, think about the degree of disorder. That means if a substance is more disordered, it means it has a higher entropy, right? Think about ice versus liquid water. So this is ice, pretty compact, solid, right? This is water, a little bit less compact, right? Less ordered. Less ordered or more disordered, whatever you wanna you wanna call it. And look at that. What I told you is right, is basically since entropy measures the degree of disorder, and since water is more disordered than solid, I can say that liquid water, sorry, let me use that term liquid water. Liquid H2O has higher entropy. than solid ice. All right, now it is this increase in entropy, right? That favors the solution formation. What's this, right? So I have a stop clock here. And let's say uh, this is some solid here and this is some solvent here. All right, so if I open this up, What's going to happen is the solute and solvent they're going to start mixing, and over time you're going to see something like this, right? Right here is it, there are more order, right? Only green is all. Let's just say this is my solute part by themselves, more ordered. This is my solvent part, all by themselves, solvent, 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 right? Water, 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 zinc nitrate, zinc nitrate, zinc nitrate, and you open it up and look at that. This has become more disordered, right? Than this, the first picture, right? Now this has become a solution, and that's why we say that since the entropy increase, right, the degree of disorderness increase, that's why the increase in entropy or disorderness favors the solution formation. All right, so I'm gonna stop here and then we're gonna talk about the different units of expressing the concentration of solutions and then how we can calculate the molality, mole fraction and other units of concentration in the next class. All right, so I hope you all have a good Tuesday and then I will, you'll hear from me in, next tomorrow.